Jalen Hynek. Is that you, darling? Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of A's for Alien podcast. My name is Patrice, and I am the fucking host of this crazy show where we talk about the strange, weird, and wonderful that this world has to offer in alphabetical order. That is a lot harder to say than you think it is. <laughs> so firstly, I'm really sorry for the late release of last week's episode, we had a bit of a COVID lockdown here and I was not feeling that motivated. You know, it affects you in strange kind of emotional, mental ways. And, you know, if you're not feeling too great about everything which is going on in the world right now, uh, whether it's affecting your job, your work, your relationships, you know, all three, just even your general sense of well-being, you know, like this is just your reminder that it's all right to fucking not be all right sometimes. And... You can take a step back, you can take a day off and the world's going to keep spinning and you're going to be fine. So, you know, if you needed to hear that, if you need permission to just take a little moment for yourself, I'm giving you that permission now. So today I'm very excited because we are talking about cryptids again and I, this is a perfect little crossover of my two great loves because if there's two things I love in the world, Actually, no, that sounds like a lie because I feel like I'm a Bigfoot girl, like deep down. But I also love all the other fucking weird and wonderful cryptids and aliens. So this story is kind of a bit of a crossover of both. And I really find it so interesting because of all the cryptids, the West Virginian cryptids that kind of span from that time between 1952 through to 1969 are just absolute fucking gold like you can't get any better um, when it comes to cryptid history and cryptid lore from that time um, in history oh did you guys hear that vocal fry then oh my fucking god i can't believe that just happened sorry i promise it won't happen again so if you've been following me on my social media you will know what the topic of this week is about because I've been talking about it all last week when really what I should have been doing was editing the episode that I haven't released yet. Um, (laughs) This is Inception because I'm talking to you from the past but in the future. So this is also the reminder to plug myself because I always forget. But uh, yeah, I've got a couple of different ways that you can connect with me if you like what I'm all about and what I present and if you want a daily dose of my madness you can follow me on Instagram I'm a is for alien podcast on Instagram I've also got a subreddit Um, I've also got a Facebook page and if you extra special love me um, I've got a patreon as well but you know obviously no pressure there because I do this for the love of it but I absolutely adore my patrons that support my artwork Um, it has like three tiers And I put those tiers in because they have like merch loyalty um, perks attached to them. But, you know, if you just want to do a dollar donation or anything like that, like there is no minimum. Um, It's just that I just set it up like that because I'm a total noob when it comes to Patreon. So I'm actually, I didn't want to put too many tiers in. But yeah, if you feel like you want to donate more or less, like feel free. So the topic this week is the Flatwoods Monster and I'm so excited because I fucking, I love this story. I love it. I love everything about it. It just, it fucking is funny to me and it's creepy and it's weird and it's kind of plausible, I guess. And then there's corroborating evidence and different kind of testimonies and, you know, it brings in a whole heap of questions that I have. And I really can't wait to kind of explore this with you. And I'm really excited to chat with my guest about it in the second segment too, because he knows a fair bit about West Virginian cryptids. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to get his take on it in the second part. Okay, so this story happened in 1952 on September the 12th in a small town called Flatwoods, which is located in Braxton County, West Virginia. So it's a really small town. I don't know how big it was back in 1952. It's hard to tell with these kind of small towns, um, whether they were bigger or smaller back then. Like normally towns kind of get bigger populations over time, but I don't know, sometimes if it's like a forestry town or a railroad town or something like that, it's, it's really hard to tell. So As of the 2010 census, though, Flatwoods has a population of 277 people. 
um, a crazy thing about, you know, small towns, especially in America, which is, is kind of hard for me to conceptualize in my mind is how nearby other towns are. So Sutton, which is um, the town over, that's the town which has the um, Flatwoods Monster Museum. And it's kind of close by. It's only like 6.4 miles, a 10 minute drive away, which is crazy in Australia because sometimes we have like hours between towns. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I that's, that's still a bit of a novelty to me. Yeah, because here it would almost be considered like an additional suburb you know, if it was only a 10 minute drive away. So I feel like I want to give you the quick kind of abridged version that I feel like everybody knows about the Flatwoods Monster. Because when I was researching this, I found a concerning amount of what I would consider disinformation. I mean, I guess it's easy to say, Patrice, it was like a two second encounter that was still talking about 70 years later. And I get that. But I also feel like there was a lot of involvement from the government, from, you know, other kind of different stakeholders, including the media. And I just, I don't, I don't think that that is like not important. I don't think that that's not relevant, you know? Okay. So this is the way that I've always told the story to people and... I've just assumed that it's been correct because every kind of documentary I've seen, every kind of, you know, television show, any kind of like cryptid board, Reddit page, all of that, it kind of, it, it, it's accepted. Like it's the same accepted kind of narrative. So there are two boys and they're playing outside and they see something fly overhead and then what they do is they go and tell their mum, mum, we saw something land in the neighbor's field. You know, can we go and see what it is? And she says, okay, yeah, all right, we'll go see what it is. And so they go over to the farmer's house and they say to the farmers, hey, look, the kids think that they saw something, maybe uh, land like a meteor or something, land on your hill. Do you mind if we go have a look? And so the farmer's obviously kind of intrigued by this as well. So they all go out there. It's about seven o'clock at night. So they get to this hill and everybody is shocked to see that when they get to the place where they thought this meteor crashed, that instead of a meteor is this giant monster looking thing that has like a bright red face and a green skirt and you know, it's making some kind of screeching noise. And when it notices that they're there, it kind of rushes down this hill towards them. They freak out and run off. And like, depending on what stories you hear, there was a dog as well. And apparently the dog got sick and ended up dying. I can't find any corroborating evidence for that. I can't find anywhere where it said that the dog died or if the dog didn't die. And then, you know, a little bit further back up story, um, they say that they were sick, like nauseous for hours after. But that's kind of, that's kind of like it. That's the kind of main legend. See, but what's happened, like what normally happens with my, this hobby of mine is that when I actually start to look into things and when I start looking for as close to original sources of this information as I can find given the time period which has gone past, I normally uncover and have more questions than what I started with. And that's the exact same case when I started looking into the Flatwoods Monster. So the main source that I'm garnering most of my information about this episode from is a book called They Knew Too Much About Flying Sources, which was published by Gray Barker in 1956. I feel like Gray Barker hasn't been as celebrated as, you know, other potential Fordians and um, paranormal investigators, cryptozoologists, such as John Keel and Ivan Sanderson. But what's interesting to know is in this book that I've read, um, they knew too much about flying saucers. It's actually the first time that the concept of men in black was introduced in a book because apparently, but without getting too far ahead of myself, there were men in black type characters that came and interviewed witnesses of this Flatwoods Monster event. Um, another thing too to note about Gray Barker 
as well is that he was one of the first people to write a book on the Mothman uh, in a book called The Silver Bridge, like way before John Keel did, even though John Keel is mostly well known for his work on the Mothman. I could have actually have done F is for Fordians because even the whole kind of like they're such interesting people like Ivan Sanderson is such an interesting person. Um, I would love to sit and speak ad nauseum about cryptozoologists and Fortean researchers. Sorry, I digress. Back to Gray Barker. So his interest in the Flatwoods monster came when he had read a newspaper article. And one of my favorite things about reading books written by people like Gray Barker, Ivan Sanderson, John Keel from this kind of time period is how they almost... They illustrate themselves as a character in the book. So he goes into this um, kind of narrative about how he was, you know, on the 15th of September, he was sitting there drinking his coffee and an irate waitress like put his coffee down on the open newspaper because, you know, she was just obviously mad that he was just sitting there with his plates under his newspaper or like, you know, whatever. And, um, <laughs> It was when like she had put the coffee down, then he had lifted up the coffee cup and had seen under it, lo and behold, an unexplained phenomenon story, which was written in his hometown because he actually heralds from Braxton County himself. The frustrated young writer and he telegrams Fate magazine about, you know, potentially writing an article on this because, you know, he's got a personal, it's almost like a passion project. So he sends them a telegram. <laughs> And they take no time in flashing back to him a wire, which says, story probably a hoax, but investigate rigorously. Don't speculate, simply state the facts. Three or four picks, up to 3,000 words, Monday deadline. At this point, he was living in Clarksburg, West Virginia, and he was unable to leave, pertaining to other circumstances, which he doesn't <laughs> expose. But by the time he actually gets to Flatwoods, it's exactly one week after the events have unfolded. I just want to stop here and actually like read to you the newspaper article that he has written in his book, which is what initially got him interested in the case. And already you're going to start to see that there's kind of differences in the way that the traditional kind of story is told as opposed to potentially like the truth. So in the book, it reads, police say Braxton monster product of mass hysteria. Sutton, September 14th. Seven Braxton County residents vowed today that a Frankenstein monster with B.O. <laughs> that like gets me every time. Anyway, sorry. That a Frankenstein monster with B.O. drove them from a hilltop near here, but police figured the smelly boogeyman was a product of mass hysteria. The thing described by witnesses as half man, half dragon had not been reported since Friday night, but residents of the area said a foul odor still clung to the hilltop yesterday. All of this started when Mrs. Kathleen May of Flatwood said that she and six boys, one, a 17 year old national guardsman climbed the hill to investigate her two sons report that a flying saucer landed there. She said that they found a fire-breathing monster 10 feet tall with bright green body and blood-red face that waddled towards them with a bouncing floating motion and sent them scurrying down the hillside. She said that the monster exuded an overpowering odour, like metal, that so sickened them that they vomited for hours afterwards. It looked worse than Frankenstein, said Mrs May. It couldn't have been human. So after I'd read this in the book, I then wanted to try and find like an original kind of copy of this because I felt like maybe there may have been some artistic liberty taken. And I also know that with some kind of associated press articles that they'd be, you know, um, shared around different newspapers. So I ended up finding one, I think, from like a North Carolina newspaper and the, the yeah, it's the Statesville Daily Record. That is the name of the newspaper that I found an almost word for word copy of, which was also published on the 15th of September. So the majority of the story is very similar, except for there are some slight variations, which I can understand why the author probably would have left out because, um, say for example, <laughs> after, after 
the part where it said that it had sent them scurrying down the hillside. The very next paragraph says, police laughed. <laughs> they said that the so-called monster had grown from seven to 17 feet in 24 hours. The flying saucer, in air quotes, Officers speculated might have been a meteor crashing to Earth. Numerous reports of bright lights in the sky were received from West Virginia and the District of Columbia Friday night. But Mrs. May stood her ground. She said that she went back to the hilltop yesterday and found skid marks one and a half car lengths long. So this is the first time that I had like read and in been introduced to this concept of like slay kind of marks, like skid marks, because I was always under the impression that this thing was floating and I'd always thought that it was kind of one of the whole kind of main points of the story and what made it really fucking strange. So yeah, there's other little bits and pieces in this as well. So the description in this newspaper article as half man, half dragon, like what does that make you think? When you think half man, half dragon, I don't know, but I'm not really envisaging this traditional Flatwoods monster imagery. When someone said to me it was a half man, half dragon, I'm thinking like a fucking reptilian straight away. I'm not thinking some kind of like glowing, you know, shape. <laughs> I don't know. So the next weird thing too is that in this article from North Carolina, as well as in the book, it says that it waddled towards them. But I also found another um, newspaper article that claimed that it duck walked. And so then I had to like Google what, what would it, what would have meant? Like, what does it mean to duck walk? And I guess that could be a waddle, but I think a duck walk is a very specific motion where something's like crouched down. But what did they mean by waddle? Because you think that if it was more of a sway, like if it was floating, then it would have, they would have said that. They would have sway, said it swayed like a dress as opposed to it waddled like a duck. And the thing is too about it is that how could it have waddled if it was on these kind of like sleigh tracks? I think too the way that Mrs. May made the comparison to Frankenstein as well was kind of fucking strange. Like, so we've got like, it's like a dragon, but it's also like Frankenstein, but it kind of looks like a man, you know, and it's, it waddles like a duck, but it's also on like sleigh, sleighs and it's seven foot tall, but it could have been 17 foot tall. Like, you know, these people saw it for two seconds. So this is kind of really fucking confusing. You know, it's almost, it's either they really saw something that they didn't know what they'd seen and they have no um, like reference to explain what they'd seen or they're making it up as they go along. But I'm, I can't, I don't know. I'm not sure. A big deal is made of the smell as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love that they called it a Frankenstein monster with B.O. <laughs> Like, that's never not going to be funny to me. I don't even know why it makes me laugh so much. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, they say that, um, you know, the smell that was coming from this creature, they could still smell it the next day and that there was a, a man called Ailey Stewart, who was the co-publisher of the Braxton County Democrat, said that when he had gone back there, I think it was the next day, he could still smell this odor that they reported to smell. So they said it was like a, you know, different reports say it was like a metallic smell, almost like a bit sulfury, you know. Um, and I think too that it was this smell that also explained... Um, like this greasy kind of oil, which Mrs. May said that she had on her dress. So when she had fallen backwards after being frightened by this creature, she got some kind of oil or grease on her dress, which that is um, kind of when the introduction, these men in black characters come in because she freely gave her dress to these people for it to be tested um, and claimed that she never got her dress back. And so that's a part of the story that I had never heard before, before researching it. Okay. So back to the story. So we left off with 
Gray Barker having to wait basically an entire week until the following Friday when the account had happened the Friday before to be able to get to Flatswoods. And so he gets there late on a Friday night and he gets to his acquaintance house who he's going to stay with while he investigates his story because it comes from the area so he knows people around there. And the person that he knows basically says, you know, that guy Ailey Stewart, like he's full of shit. This story is a hoax. Those marks that were made um, these sleigh marks that were made, you know, I even know the guy whose tractor it was and I'm pretty sure that the grease and oil can be explained by just being grease and oil from that greasy old tractor. So the next day when he wakes up, he realizes that there are three people that he wanted to speak to who was um, this publisher, Mrs. May, and also um, the 17 year old boy uh, who was in the National Guard. They've all gone to New York to do an interview on a television show called We The People. So going by what I can deduce from looking for this, I can't really find any video of this TV show. That would have been so fucking cool. If you have ever come across that interview, if you've ever seen it or know where you'd be able to find it, um, I think it was season five, episode 12 of the television show We The People. Interestingly, only two months prior to that, guess who had been on this same TV show in New York? Dwight Eisenhower. And if anybody knows anything about UFOs and Dwight Eisenhower and the 1950s, let's just say it was a little bit fucking exciting and there's lots of conspiracy theories about Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s and UFOs. So I feel like that's that's a little bit of a fucking coincidence, don't you think? And also a bit of a coincidence that 1952 was the year that Project Blue Book was created but you know i feel like i feel like i'm gonna get into that a little bit later i don't know i might have given that away when i mentioned old mate um jalen hynek straight off the bat for those of you with a keen ear so as a result of this television interview he'd have to wait to kind of interview two of the major players in this story and you know things weren't turning out that great because the mayor of um sutton J. Holt Byrne. He was also the editor of the Braxton Central. He had told reporters and also his constituency that the phenomena was most definitely caused by a meteorite and it was probably gas from the meteorite that had, you know, engulfed the witnesses and that was probably what had suffocated them and made them form an image of a monster in their minds. So... <laughs> It's not really, that's not really Occam's razor, is it? That's not really like applying the most simple explanation. Like I feel like there is a lot of artistic license in that. And has there ever been a fucking case in history where gas from a meteorite has made people hallucinate? Let me know in the comments if you've ever heard of that. In time to burn before he actually was able to interview the primary witnesses, he had gone and seen the mayor. And he was kind of surprised to find out that the mayor had kind of started to change his tune a little bit. And he was actually prepared to speak to Ivan Sanderson, who had arrived in town too. But he was actually the one who had suggested to Gray Barker that perhaps he should go and visit the Nunley boy. Because Neil Nunley, who was 14, he was also part of the group of people who had seen it. And the mayor had heard that his account of the story was really level-headed and maybe wasn't as embellished as what Mrs. May and her sons had been telling people. Probably most interesting of all, though, was the fact that Neil Nunley lived with his grandfather. And his grandfather had an independent story corroborating the events of what happened because... He claimed that when he was sitting on his porch, something had come over the horizon from the southeast. He did not look at it until it had come to his view overhead, and then it flashed in a southwesterly direction towards the hill opposite him. And he said that he saw an oblong object, and the top of it was a light shade of red, and the bottom side of it was bright red. He also said that it was shooting red balls of fire out the back of it and at that time he thought that it was a jet plane though he saw no wings. He didn't see the nose of the object clearly and it proceeded across the sky, suddenly halted and then seemed to fall rapidly towards the hilltop. So that was the grandfather's story, not realising that his grandson was also seeing and experiencing something very similar and his story is 
basically what I think, in my opinion, considering that Gray Barker is doing justice to this, uh, I guess, teenager story at this time, is probably the closest that will come to a true account of what actually happened. So when Gray met with um, Neil, he said that he was just like a no-nonsense kid. His exact words were unspoiled by sophistication and that he talks with the honest accent of the West Virginia farm people, which I'm sure he means that in the kindest and sweetest of ways. When I hear stuff like that, though, what that means to me is, you know, my, my family, my dad's side of the family are country people that come from a farming family. And it's kind of like, I, I really have a problem with people that don't come from the country, that haven't hunted, that haven't fished, that haven't been out in nature, coming in and saying, oh no, what this person saw was an owl. Because these people know what a fucking owl looks like. These people know what a bear looks like. These people know the place that they've grown up, that they've hunted in, fished in. They know the difference. So if someone from one of these small towns says that they saw something kind of fucking weird, like they probably saw something weird in my opinion. So Neil said that he was hanging out at a nearby playground with some other youths and they saw the strange object kind of flash across the sky. So what was different from um, AM Jordan description that he said that he saw it as light red on top and dark red glowing on the bottom. The boys said that it wasn't and that it looked like a silver dollar in color and shape and that it was not oblongated. But they did say that there was a trail of fire shooting out behind it. They said that it was flying low, so it was flying literally just above the hilltop. A really interesting detail, which was similar to AM Jordan's and the boys' account of what happened though, which I found so fascinating, is that the boys said that it stopped above the hilltop and hovered, which is exactly what Neil's grandfather said. And then, very specifically, he said that it descended, but it looked just like a door falling down flatwards. I just, once again, we have these obscure fucking descriptions. Like, I don't think I would ever fucking describe something as a door falling down flatwise. You know, I guess we can all imagine that. And I'm trying to put myself in like 1952. And I guess that we have so many more kind of things to draw upon that we can say that's what it looked like. And and maybe, you know, that's that's why we're able to describe kind of paranormal things more convincingly. And I guess it makes them less convincing in a way because people think that we've just seen it in a movie. Whereas if you literally saw something hover, which at this point in time and science isn't possible, maybe it would look like how a door slowly kind of falls flat wise. Cause I guess it is almost buffered by that pillow of air. They said that they watched it fall. And then after they, f- that it fell, they said that they could still see the light at the top of the hill top. And so they could still see this thing. They knew it was there. So then they were like, oh my God, we have to go and see what it is. And so this makes sense, right? So then what Neil said was that they gathered this posse and they went to Mrs. May's house and they stopped there because it was at the bottom of the hill. But the reason that they had even gone there was to say that they needed a flashlight, which makes fucking logical sense because it's getting darker. And so... Mrs. May's two children described the object to their mother and she was a little bit like, that sounds like some straight up bullshit. But then they kind of convinced her to go out onto the porch and she went out there and she saw it herself. And Neil said that it was pulsating. So it was going from dim to bright. And so she decided to go with them with the torch. And so like the older boy, um, Lemon, who was 17 in the National Guard, Like that's kind of when this posse of kids were kind of there. So originally I had like always thought that there was only like the two kids and the mom. And I never really understood where the rest of them came from. But this kind of fills in the gaps like that. They were kind of just hanging out together at the playground, saw this thing float over. Then they've gone to like go investigate it, stopped off at Mrs. May's house to get a torch. Her sons have told them what they've seen. She's walked out onto the porch and seen it herself and said, yeah, I'm definitely going to come and see what this is. 
they said that they weren't afraid at this point. Like they had no reason to be afraid. I think that they genuinely probably thought that maybe it was like a meteor or just something like cool had fallen from space. So everyone was kind of more excited when they were running up this hill to see what had landed on the hill. They said that they gradually started to smell something a little bit strange, but they weren't too kind of worried about it. And it wasn't until they were just at the hilltop that they kind of realized that maybe it wasn't just a meteorite. <laughs> So they said they got to the part of this hill where there's this fence and there's a rodden gate and um, they obviously had to like kind of get over the gate. And Neil Nunley says that the first thing that the group noticed was, and how's this word, globular, a globular mass, which was on the other side of the hilltop to their right, about 50 feet away. And he said that it just looked like a giant ball of fire and it said that it seemed to dim and brighten at regular intervals he didn't know how large it was but the other kids had said that they thought that it was as large as a house and you know it's interesting because in all of the newspaper articles when they talk about the places of the ground that had depressions in it they talk about it only being like eight foot in diameter like circular and if this thing was as big as a house, obviously the depression would need to be bigger than just an eight foot diameter. There was never really any kind of clarification as to what this specific shape was, like if it was a perfect sphere or if it was like a hemisphere, like they don't, they don't really allude to that. But the word globular, globular, it's such a specific descriptive word. Like when you consider a, something which is globular and on fire, like, what does that imagery elicit to you? Like, to me, I imagine almost like candle wax, like a like a, a a bunch of candle wax. I don't know. Like, Google the word globular and see what comes up. As I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that they're saying globular and meaning more like like a globe, like a spherical shape. Whereas I think it's just my kind of health science degree which is making me think of like globular proteins um <laughs> so i'm thinking like a glob of blood i'm thinking hemoglobin i'm thinking like cell structure so like don't listen to me okay so back to the story neil said so he's standing there like by this broken gate can see this ball of fire which seems to be pulsating in brightness uh, he says that there was no noise, but other people in the group said that they heard um, like a low thumping or beating sound, it sounded like someone was hitting a canvas, and that there was another noise which they said which was almost like halfway between a hiss and the noise that a jet plane makes. Speaking of planes, I want to take this moment as well to speak about something which I think is probably like maybe underreported in this story as well, is that apparently... The same time that all this had happened, so the same time that the kids had seen this silver dollar flying across the sky, that AM Jordan had seen, you know, this red object fly across the sky, the Braxton County Sheriff Robert Carr in Sutton received a phone call from a hitchhiker who claimed that he had seen a Piper Club plane crash into the hillside near Frangetown and that it was burning and that he had seen it from a car in which he had, had like, been catching a lift from and that the first moment he was able to make a phone call he rang to report the incident and so Sheriff Carr and a deputy rushed 17 miles to the scene but they found no trace of a burning plane and they could find no one who had supposedly witnessed the crash so there was no smoke there was nothing so they just assumed that nothing had happened and maybe that it was a crank call but just remember that name frame town just remember frame town for me just just put that on the back burner for two seconds while we finish talking about flatwoods so while everyone was just watching this pulsating light from the hill lemon the national guardsman 17 year old thought that he had seen a pair of eyes looking at him you know and thought it was some kind of animal so he like flashed his light over to where the eyes were it was then that they realized that it wasn't an animal, but it was actually more like a man shape 
kind of object. And Mrs. May would later say that it wasn't until the light kind of hit the creature that it, it's almost like it lit up from within. So everyone that saw it agreed that it had a round face that was blood red. No one noticed a nose or a mouth, only the eyes. And they didn't even know if it was they were actually eyes, but they thought they were eye-like openings. And they said that they shone like a greenish orange beams of light. So the lights are like shooting out beams. And, you know, some of the group thought that the beams were like being shot at them like lasers. But Neil said, no, they weren't. They were being shot above them. And um, I thought that was really weird. Like, shoot. so if they were shooting above them, it's almost like they were shooting into the sky. And when I read, when I heard that, I started to think more like, anyway, no, no, I'm not going to give away yet. I'll wait till the end. I'll wait till the end till I have my my theory. He said that this creature was 15 feet away from them. Like that's really fucking close. So for those of us who live in the metric system, like 15 feet, that's only four and a half meters. That's nothing. That's really, really, really close. That's scary close. So around this red face, was apparently a dark hood-like shape, which they said looked like, um, you know, an ace, an ace of spades. Once again, even there was no consensus amongst these kids about what it actually looked like, because a lot of kids said that it was green. And then one kid drew it with like flames around it. But Neil said that it was colorless. Meanwhile, Mrs. May said that she saw what looked like clothing like folds around the body and it had terrible claws which none of the other people reported you know strangely too the news reports don't talk about those details like when you read the news report it it doesn't sound as scary as what they describe it later and so i can imagine you know that may be why the police laughed at this account because so say here it just says oh it looked like it had a flushed face and a green body that seemed to glow like that could mean anything you know as opposed to when you go back and think about it and you're like you know what no actually it was like 15 feet tall it had a bright red face it looked like it was wearing a green skirt it had long claws like it does start to sound a little bit ridiculous, but like I said earlier, if you've never seen anything like this, if you have no reference to something like this, like how do you how do you describe something that you've never even seen? And you know, like sure, there were science fiction stories around, but not to the level that we have now. You know, like we might be able to um, determine be better at describing things now just because we have so many years of pop culture under our belt that we're able to whereas these these people these folks weren't able to once again they were pretty there was a general consensus on the smell that they said it was like a burning metal smell um like smelt like sulfur and it was like instantly sickening like it just seemed to like grab your throat and your nasal passages next part about how Nunley describes it moving was also something which I had found interesting and hadn't heard before. And it was different to the other accounts. So he said that when it was moving towards them, he didn't believe that it was moving towards them, like to come and get them. But what he said it did was that it moved towards them, but it was moving in more of a circular path that would take it back to the globe. So he didn't think it was attacking them. It's almost like he believed that it was running away. And also when he was questioned, like how it moved, like if it could, if, if he could um, imitate how it moved, he said, I can't move the way that it did. He just said, it just moved. It didn't walk. It didn't jump. It just moved. And um, yeah, it's got me started to think like, was this a fucking hologram? 
like, was this something to scare people away? You know, was it like the lights, the eyes, like you said, the eyes weren't looking at them. It was like looking at the sky. Like, was it some kind of distress beacon? Was it trying to signal to something that it crashed? Like he's, you know, the way that Nunley describes it, like moving on an arc, like, like it was moving on a track, you know, maybe it was some kind of decoy or it's, it's not really like a tangible thing at all. Like it's, it was just a projection, a decoy. So after that, they just fucking booked it as you would when it started to move. And Nunley said that, you know, it, it wasn't a long time. It was literally just enough for them to get a good look at it. And then they left. <laughs> and yeah, they jumped over fences, just ran down the hill. And that was that. And see, I don't know about you guys, but I always hate it when stories just end here. Like it's so normal that this is the time when the stories just end. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're like, oh yeah, I saw this creature and then that was that. And it's like, no, but what happened then? Like, that can't just be the, the whole story after you've just experienced this fucking horrific thing. Like, something must have happened. Like, what else has happened after that? Like, even just the mundane things. Like, did you go to a fucking doctor? Like, did you call the police? Like, what did the police say? Like, I have all these questions in my head. And luckily, in this case we can get some answers to them. And I don't know about you guys, but I haven't ever fucking heard this before until I had read it in this book. So hopefully I'm um, sharing something new with you too. Let me know if this is the first time you've heard this kind of account of the Flatwoods Monster story. I'd love to know. So bizarrely, one of the first people on the scene <laughs> was a director of a funeral home. And he said that he administered like first aid to these people and I don't know do you think someone from a funeral home is actually like qualified to <laughs> administer first aid I found that really funny for some reason I think that must just be my dark twisted sense of humor <laughs> yes so he didn't want to talk about it people tried to interview him and he was just like no I was at church that night someone else who got there really quickly was Ailey Stewart Jr and he was the um the co-editor of the Braxton Democrat who was the man who had gone to the TV interview with Mrs. May. And he arrived within half an hour of the incident. He said that when he got there, he found uh, some of the seven receiving the first aid. And he said that they were just too afraid to speak properly. Like he couldn't get the story out of them properly. And that's completely fucking normal response. Like that to me adds credibility because you think – um, if it was a made-up story, if you were just making up a story, you'd be excitedly telling the story. You know, I think that that's what happened with, you know, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. Like, people didn't really believe Roger Patterson just because of the fervor that he decided to tell the story with. When really, when you've seen something that would have, that should have scared you like that badly, you know, maybe there might be a moment of pause. He eventually convinced the older boy to go back up the hill with him to check it out. And obviously when they got there, everything was gone. There was no smell, didn't see anything. But he had the foresight to remember that gas settles. And so he put his face kind of closer to the ground and he could smell the smell that Mrs. May and the kids had reported. So that kind of shocked him a little bit. You know, unfortunately of all of the senses and of all of the evidence, probably a smell is the worst one because <laughs> it just will dissipate and there's no proof of it. Like you can't really capture a smell. So that is the conclusion to the main part of the story. That's the main kind of story that everybody knows about the Flatwoods monster, which is, you know, primarily kind of focused on Mrs. May because she was the adult there and her two sons. But intriguingly enough, well, at least for me, I find that what happens from this point on is what makes the story really interesting and possibly worth further investigation or at least further thought. And I'm going to be really interested to find out if those of you who are aware of this story before listening to this podcast, if you knew about these stories before I tell you about them. 
So remember how I mentioned that there was a hitchhiker who had called in to the Sutton police station and told them that there was a plane which had crashed just outside of Frametown and the police had gone there and there wasn't anything there, yada yada. Well, the thing about that was maybe that there was something there because we have a second encounter with an entity which is surprisingly similar to the Flatwoods monster description that happens in Frametown, just outside of Frametown. And I can't find a source which would actually say, you know, whether, because I had read both, whether it was like the next day as in hours later, or if it was the next day as in Saturday night later. But, so the story goes like this. There was a young couple from Queens in New York who were traveling through Braxton County with their 18-month-old daughter. And they were driving along a dirt road near a wooded area when suddenly the car stopped dead. So he tried to restart the car and it wasn't starting. He was trying to turn it over and it wouldn't turn over. And then all of a sudden they were kind of aware of this like burning smell, this sulfur-like smell, which was strong enough that it even troubled their child and the baby started crying. So the man gets out and he decides to inspect the engine, pops the hood because he thinks maybe the engine's on fire. So you better go and have a look. Um, as he's out there inspecting the car, he noticed that there's a purple light which is emanating from the woods. And he kind of thought, well, wow, that's a bit strange. <laughs> so he decided that he would go and have a look. And I don't, I don't know. Let me know what you think. Are you going to walk towards a purple light in the woods in the middle of nowhere? He did. And he said that as he was walking towards this light, he started to feel um, feelings of like electric charges going through his legs, like almost like static electric shocks. And a really interesting point about this was that it reminded me of yet another story, which I find to be a credible UFO sighting, which was the Rendlesham Forest incident. And the people who were around the craft said that they had a similar sensation of um, like electrical shocks and almost like a paralysis kind of feeling through their legs and you know that would make sense if it was kind of like say this craft was propelled by some kind of electromagnetic force you know there would be some kind of magnetic field electromagnetic field which maybe might interact with our body or you know alternatively it may even be some kind of like self-defense mechanism because i don't know if you've ever had one of those tens machines on your on your body anywhere but when electricity goes through your body, it spasms your muscles and you can't move. So, you know, maybe it was something as simple as that as well. So the man reported seeing some kind of craft in the woods. And so as he's seen this, he's kind of turned his back and he's gone to walk towards his wife, who's still sitting in the car, like wondering what's going on. And it's then that he just like hears her hysterically screaming. And he's kind of like, what is she screaming about? And so he turns around and he looks and sees that there is a creature that's about seven to nine feet tall, right? In what they described as some kind of strange tube-like device. So very similar to how the Flatwoods monster was described as wearing that kind of metallic suit, metallic kind of skirt. But there was one simple difference with the description that this couple gave, which was different from the Flatwoods monster, because they said that it had like a reptilian head. So at first I was thinking, oh no, like that's completely different because they're describing it as a reptilian. And you know, we're all familiar with the Flatwoods monster description of it kind of, you know, looking like a big red face with um you know big glowing eyes and it kind of looks like a spade like a ace of spades head with a green dress on and kind of long claws and so that's kind of the description that has been accepted into the folklore and that's what people accept but what's interesting is after i've read this story and when i went back and read the original newspaper articles how mrs may described the creature initially was she said that it was like a half man half dragon that's what she said that it looked like a half man half dragon and that sounds like a reptilian to me 
I feel like that aspect of the story has really been kind of forgotten when it comes to the retelling of this story because we are so conditioned by the image that we have in our head that was published in the newspaper that's seen everywhere like so much so that this is another kind of like little strange sub fact that there is this strange obsession with the Flatwoods monster and retro Japanese video games it's a, it's a thing like look it up it's hilarious and I kind of tried to do a little bit of um research into why it would be like such a such a fascination um specifically the flatwoods monster and how it looks and i guess the closest answer that i could kind of find was that the japanese version of apro was founded maybe like three or four years after the flatwoods monster incident had happened and i think in the 1950s too there was like a real kind of westernization and americanization of japan during that period as well and so um these tabloid stories were coming through about these ufo and alien abduction stories and i think it really just captured the imagination of the japanese people and they even have a special name for it which is san metro no chujin which literally translates to three meter tall alien which i fucking love Sorry, I'm on a tangent and I literally have an entire sub-series dedicated to me being on tangents. So I haven't actually finished the story about the frame town sighting yet. Sorry. So the dude turns around and he sees this alien. If you want to look this man up, his name was George Snidowski as well. S-N-I-T-O-W-S-K-Y because it's actually kind of hard to find information on this. I think I came across it only by seeing like a strange picture of a half Flatwoods monster, half reptilian and I kind of wanted to look more into what this was about. So his name was George Sniskowski and so he's seen this alien and he's heard his wife screaming and so then he's kind of like looked at this alien for a little bit and then he's decided to go back to the car, which is probably like a great idea. So he's gone back to his car and he's jumped in the car and he's pushed his wife and his baby underneath the kind of like into the front seat. And he himself is kind of hidden and he's like, okay, hopefully if we just chill here for a second, the alien's going to leave us alone. So they kind of hid for what they thought was about five minutes. And then he kind of looks up and he can see this nine foot tall alien still like staring at them through the windscreen of their car. Like that's a nightmare fuel. <gasps> Cause you know, there'd be a part of you which would just hope that it would go away because doesn't that just seem to be the case? Like people that want to have encounters that go longer, they're over in the blink of an eye. People that are like, I just, I want to ignore this thing and then hopefully it will go away and then you reopen your eyes and like it's there still staring at you like <laughs> what are the odds of that happening <laughs> so anyway he looks up sees this thing still looking at him he then watches the creature do a lap of the car and when it comes back to the front of the car it runs its hand or its hand appendage i guess across the front of the bonnet and he said that the hands were like, look like two kind of finger claws, um, not like human hands. So I assume at this point, then the creature just floated back off into the woods and disappeared. And then at some point their car was able to restart and they would drive off. That's all a bit inconspicuous. Like, I really, I really hate that, that there isn't kind of any further kind of more mundane information about these stories because that's what I'm really interested in. So when I when I become a paranormal investigator as a full-time job, I'm going to be asking all those silly questions like when did your car start? What did you do when you got home? Like, you know, those kind of questions. Like I just don't want to be like, yeah, the alien dragged its fingers across the bonnet and that's all I remember. It's like, no, I need to know like how did you get out of this situation? Like did the car start? Did a car come past and pick you up? Like, did the alien stalk your car longer? Like that, it just frustrates me that we'll never know those answers. So it kind of makes you wonder, you know, knowing that, like assuming that both these stories are true and that there was 
you know, a sighting of a being in Flatwoods and then there's a sliding of a being in Frametown, which is not too far away. Could these creatures be the same creature or are they different creatures? Because remember, at the same time that the sighting was happening on Friday night, the hitchhiker had called the police. So I'm thinking that they're two separate incidences. A few people online seem to think that it's the same creature just because of the timeline that it happened, you know, like a certain seven hours or so later. But I wonder if they're not aware of this plane crash report, which was phoned in. Because I feel like if they knew about a separate incident kind of occurring in that area, that maybe, you know, it's more likely that it's two. Okay, yeah, so, so far, very compelling, very bizarre, you know, adds a little bit more dimension to the Flatwoods monster story. But it's this next part, which is so wacky and goofy, that at first sight you think, oh, like, this is so goofy and wacky. <laughs> I would like to introduce to you the story of Bashful Billy from Wheeling, West Virginia. And I understand that Wheeling is quite far away from Frametown and Flatwoods. In actual fact, it's 342 miles, a five hour and 14 minute car ride. And just for your knowledge, the most direct route to get to Wheeling, West Virginia from Flatwoods is actually to go through Morgantown and the Moth Boys are hosting an event called Crypto Bash in Morgantown this weekend. So you should get along to that if you're around the place that is this weekend, the 7th of August, 2021. And yeah, you may be thinking, is this just an elaborate ad for Cryptid Bash this weekend, just like The Wizard was for the Nintendo Glove? And yes, it is, actually. I mean, it's not really, but I'd definitely get along if I was in the States this weekend. Unfortunately, I'm not, so I will not be there, but hopefully next year you can catch me there. So I was introduced to the concept of this bashful Billy character by reading an article that I had found just by chance, really, just by reading articles that were kind of associated with the Flatwoods monster and obviously being West Virginia, there are lots of kind of Mothman related news articles and all this kind of stuff. But I saw something called a bashful Billy and I'd never heard of that before. So I thought this is quite interesting, but I even, you know, it's more interesting than I thought. So <laughs> let's look at this. I'm going to read it for you in its entirety and then we'll have a chat about it. So powered by suggestion, question mark is the subheading. Then in air quotes, it says a monster from outer space arrives here via saucer in air quotes by Dent Williams of the Intelligencer staff. Bashful Billy, in air quotes, the monster from outer space and southern West Virginia arrived in Wheeling by flying saucer yesterday and promptly set tongues wagging and telephones burning. Even the Wheeling police prepared to call our all space cadets. Telephones of the Wheeling Intelligencer and city police kept humming last night as anxious residents attempted to confirm the rumours, but in true Hollywood style, the monster apparently vanished without pausing to light a single cigarette with his fiery breath. One call to the Intelligencer asked if it was true that a horribly burned body of a woman was found at the Vineyard Hill and that a city policeman was burned mysteriously about the arms. Police Lieutenant John P. Murphy reported similar calls pertaining to an injured policeman and in one instance was asked to send a patrolman to Vineyard Hill for guard duty. Since no members of the department are equipped with Buck Rogers rocket guns, Lieutenant Murphy declined to assign a man to the area. The only green-eyed monster I ever heard of was a jealous woman, Detective Howard Millard said last night. Callers also reported that an unpleasant odour was produced by the monster, who evidently hasn't been found. Excuse me, bitch. Did you just say horribly burned body of a woman and a policeman with a burnt arm? In the middle of that goofy fucking <laughs> Buck Rogers rocket guns and fiery breath spiel? Like, did they really just hide that information in there like that? Did they really just drop that? into this goofy fucking news article. 
So looking at this article piece by piece, in the first instance, they call it Bashful Billy, and I'm not even quite sure why. I don't know whether it's almost like they're saying because it because of the stories were coming from, you know, Flatwoods and, you know, they allude to it being from outer space and southern West Virginia. I don't like is it kind of almost like a hillbilly reference, I guess? Like they're trying to make fun of people from southern kind of West Virginia? You know, I think maybe that's kind of how it starts, like making fun of these people for this story of this alien that they've heard of. Um, so, yeah, it's it's quite obvious from from that reference to the monster from outer space and southern West Virginia is that they are talking about the Flatwoods monster. So in the next instance, they recognize that there was lots of people calling the police station and lots of people calling the newspaper. So they have confirmed that fact. And why would people randomly be calling? You know, that's the thing which gets me. Like people don't just spontaneously call the police and the newspaper and say that they're seeing an alien or a monster, you know, um, what? So we have confirmation of that. We have confirmation that people were concerned about something. What it was, we may never know. But on that particular night, they were anxious about something. The wording's really interesting how they say that they were calling the police to confirm a rumor, but that's inappropriate. You don't call the police to confirm a rumor, do you? Don't you, conf you call the police to report something that you've seen or something that's worrying you? And so that, that part is what concerns me about the response from Lieutenant John P. Murphy when he says that there were lots of phone calls from people concerned about something that was happening in that area and they flat out refused to participate. So whilst recognizing people were concerned about something, he also made a public denial that the police department was involved when literally only in the paragraph before the real kind of truth of this story was stated when they said that a horribly burned body of a woman was found at Vineyard Hill and that a city policeman was burned mysteriously about the arm. See, like, that's a really crazy, serious, horrific <laughs> image to just nestle in amongst, you know, fire-breathing monsters lighting cigarettes and green-eyed women being jealous monsters and, you know, Buck Rogers bloody, you know little like rocket guns and stuff like what the final kind of paragraph which says callers also reported that an unpleasant odor was produced by the monster that also shows that these people weren't calling to confirm a rumor they were calling because they had smelt a monster they had smelt it so they had had an encounter so there were people who'd had an encounter calling the police saying that there was something strange and you know yeah that that confirms that because you got, you don't smell something strange and then want to confirm a rumor when you are reporting that you smelt that smell come from the monster but back to this burnt woman that they just dropped on us what's what are they alluding to here are they alluding to the fact that the monster has killed this woman or is it completely unrelated? Because how do you write a silly story like this when people are thinking that someone's been killed by this monster, that there's someone died? You know, there's nothing funny about this if it's true. So it's kind of like, how, how are they speaking about these two things in the same breath? Which makes me think that the real reason behind this story is a cover up. 100% but covering what up like did did the monster did this alien kill a fucking person and they're trying to hide it in plain sight by putting it in the newspaper or is it something else which is what I kind of think also I just wanted to mention as well 
that when I, I looked into Vineyard Hill and what it actually was, like if it was kind of, because it sounds just like to me, when I hear the word Vineyard Hill, I think it was literally like some somewhere rural, like where there wasn't a lot of people, you know, maybe someone had been like looking out from their, their home and been able to see something. But no, like actually in 1952, Vineyard Hill was almost like a public housing estate that had been built because in its heyday Wheeling was uh you know quite a powerful production place that forged steel glass nails tiles pottery they made toys textiles cigars like you name it they even had like a country music show that was <laughs> like nationally syndicate syndicated out of Wheeling and um yeah so they it was a very kind of busy place like there's photos of it you know it was almost like apartment style living uh in this place which was called vineyard hills so if people were calling up it's probably because there were lots of people there that had seen what was going on so my theory on this dead woman if there was even a woman that that just gave it away (laughs) oh my god i'm the worst i'm the worst at telling stories (laughs) What if this alleged woman that people had seen was actually not a woman at all and was in actual fact this Flatwoods monster, this frame town monster, and from a distance people thought that it looked like a woman because it was horribly disfigured because it was a reptilian with a red face, a red reptilian, and what if this skirt-like thing that it had on made it look like it was a horribly burned dead woman from afar and that this whole news article about it being like a dead woman and you know i don't know whose logic it was but remember we are thinking 1950s goofy logic like literally anything anything could happen all right so i can't wait to hear what you think about this story um, I love the Flatwoods monster story. I think it's so much fun. I really love the little additional stories that I found. And yeah, if you haven't already caught the Tifa Tangent episode that I did on Monday, I kind of recapped the 1952 Washington DC UFO flap. And I guess that kind of adds a little bit of context to the story. Another point of interest that makes the Flatwoods monster story even more compelling is that it is well known that in the summer of 1952, there was quite a large UFO flap. Lots of people were seeing UFOs. I explained in the Tifa Tangent episode that a lot of that had to do with the Ground Observation Corps that was part of, um, you know, the home front um, help i guess that people were participating in because we were in a cold war with the russians um and also we had entered into a conflict like was smack bang in the middle of the korean war so it was kind of terse times um in the political world arena but specifically september the 12th which was kind of after the ufo sightings had all died down September the 12th, which was the day of the Flatwoods monster sighting. It was actually quite a big day for UFO reports. So apparently there was over 102 locations across the United States where witnesses saw and reported strange aerial craft over nine East Coast states during a 21 hour span. And You know, obviously, furthermore to that, there was accounts of them crashing um, and entities being seen. And also on the September the 12th, there was a newspaper article from the Greensboro Daily, um, which was dated on the 13th of September, saying Air Force probes flying saucers, four states, dis reports unexplained. And it talks about how there's only been 400 of 2000 reports that have been able to be explained um, that have come in as unusual aerial phenomena. So yeah. And apparently 25% of those reports that were, you know, researched by that newspaper that they were reporting on had actually been 
put forward by military personnel. So I don't know. It, I love having a little bit of food for thought. I love being able to look back at that time and think, what was going on back then? You know, was it some kind of man-made craft? Was it something supernatural, extraterrestrial? You know, we're, we're probably never going to know um, so that's pretty much it on the Flatwoods Monster. If you have anything that I've left out that you'd like to add, please either send me an email to asforalienpodcast at gmail.com or leave a little comment down below if you're watching this on YouTube. I love hearing from you guys and I love hearing your feedback on the stories that I cover. Okay, so full disclosure, there wasn't an interview this week. I know that I said that there was going to be an interview earlier on, and that's because I recorded that part of the show before I actually got to recording this part of the show. And yeah, to be honest, guys, I've been a hot mess this week. COVID has really hit my country really hard. And um, as a result, my like civilian job has been <laughs> affected by that. And I've kind of been having a really huff, rough time with uh, what that means. So it's kind of affected my productivity, but not to worry because, um, you know, it's just one of those things. And like I said earlier on in the episode, um, you know, if you're having a bad time, like just take the pressure off yourself and just relax a little bit and, you know, just, just do what you can. Like every day can be a victory, you know, if you just have a small goal, <laughs> but yeah, no, in all seriousness, uh, yeah, the schedules just didn't work out. So I've just gone solo this week and, um, yeah, I hope that you don't mind too much. Um, yeah, just listening to my voice the entire time. So we're going to jump in straight into a listener email and yeah, considering uh, Australia has turned into a complete dumpster fire with COVID this week. I thought it would be quite apt if I did a listener story from an Australian listener. And if you are new here and you're not sure about how this works, I love and encourage hearing your experiences. Uh, you can email them to me at a is for alien podcast at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be... Um, about the topic that I'm talking about. So any of your stories, I'd love to hear, just send them through because, you know, I think it's just a lot of fun to be able to share with people stories that people may not have heard before and especially your own kind of um, experiences. We can have a discussion about it, like get my opinion on it. Do you know what I mean? So I have a lot of fun doing it. So I really appreciate it when I get emails from you guys. So this email comes from Lowrider and he says that he grew up in northeast Victoria in Australia near the tourist town of Beechworth. Beechworth housed the famous Mayday Hills Lunatic Asylum, which has been shut down for a few years before I was born, but it had a gory past. In more recent years, the asylum has had ghost tours, which I have been on multiple times. Most times, I have been taking these tours with friends and the whole thing is taken very lightly and none of us have consciously seen anything. On one trip though, admittedly poor planning, I ended up on the tour with just myself and the tour guide. Having been there multiple times and living locally, I had gotten to know the tour guide and we had agreed to drop the theatrics and just see what we could see. I had never believed in ghosts and didn't really think I would ever see anything as I'd never had before. At the time when we were walking around, there should have only been one other person on site, the receptionist. We entered the old cellar. I think it was a cellar. It was where the food stores used to be kept at least. As we walked down the stairs, there was a temperature drop, but that was normal because we were going underground. The room was separate from another section with bars, which used to ensure that the inmates couldn't get into the food stores. When we walked down there, something felt different though. I couldn't really explain it then and struggle to explain it now as it happened nearly four years ago, but all of my senses felt heightened, almost like I could feel something in the air. I looked around to make sure that the tour guide wasn't trying to pull anything, but he was standing across the room. I found my body tensing without consciously doing it, as if my body was preparing for something. I called out to the tour guide and tried to laugh it off, but he looked back at me looking exactly like I felt and not wanting to joke around. We decided to get out of the cellar right then and there, rather than wait for anything else to happen. As we walked back to the stairs, 
the feeling I had had since I walked down the stairs spiked and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something at the bars out of the corner of my eye. As I turned to look again, there was nothing there, but my body wasn't going to let me be there any longer. Any other time I had been in the cellar with my friends and we had been laughing off all of the stories told by the tour guide. But as I said before, there was no stories being told this time. When we got outside, I asked the guy if he had seen anything. Of course, it is his job to say yes, but we both seem to have been in the heightened state. Part of me wants to believe that it was all just brain chemicals. But the more you guys talk about this stuff, the more I feel like it may have been real. Love to see you back at it. Keep it up. Big love, Lowrider. Firstly, let's talk about the asylum itself, the Beechworth Asylum, also known as the Beechworth Hospital for the Insane and the Maydays Hills Mental Hospital. It was a decommissioned hospital located in Beechworth, a town in Victoria, Australia, and it was the second such hospital to be built in Victoria. And it was also one of the three largest. So it's actually, it's just, it's incredibly beautiful. And it was massive. So it was reportedly surrounded by almost 260 acres of farmland, making the hospital self-sufficient with its own piggery, orchards, kitchen gardens, fields, stables, and a barn. For recreation, the asylum included tennis courts, an oval, a cricket pavilion, kiosk, and a theater. So it closed in 1995 following 128 years of consecutive operation. So this, you know, I haven't been to this asylum, but I have been to one of the sister asylums because uh, there's another two sister hospitals, which are kind of very similar looking at Ararat and also in Kew. And I just remember driving into Ararat and seeing this absolutely gorgeous building just sitting on the hill and thinking, oh my God, like what is, what is that place? It looked like a palace because it's just so incredibly beautiful. And it doesn't look like a mental asylum because these hospitals have ha-ha walls. And if you don't know what a ha-ha wall is, it's basically a, a courtyard which has a trench on one side. So from one side of the fence, it looks like, um, like kind of almost how, uh, some enclosures are at zoos. Like on one side of the fence, it looks like the fence is only like a meter tall, but then on the side of the fence where the things are that you're trying to keep in, there's like a 12, 15 foot trench that no one can get out of. You know what? That would be so much fun. Would you guys want to see me do a ghost hunt one day, like a bit of a ghost tour thing and maybe go to these places? Um, I could check them all out, I guess. Let me know if, if you think it would be entertaining to see me do a ghost hunt. <laughs> so the subject line that Lowrider had used for the email that they sent to me was, are ghosts scared of laughter? And, you know, it's really interesting that you said that you've been there so many times before and you'd had so many like tours there and had never experienced anything because you'd normally always go with friends and you're having a bit of a lark and trying to scare yourself. And, you know, I don't know if ghosts, if ghosts are a thing, if they're like afraid of laughter, but I do feel that there is some kind of truth in you know, a universal law of like attracting like. And that's something which I found when I was researching all the demonology stuff and Ed and Lorraine Warren, that they would talk about like attracting like. So if you are like happy and having fun and you're, you're in a place where, you know, maybe there weren't people who were necessarily happy or having fun, they're probably not going to manifest themselves to you because they need to match your vibration or somehow match your energy in some kind of way. So maybe because you were kind of more somber or more serious uh, in this ghost tour that you did this time, maybe there was someone or something that was more somber and was more serious that was able to connect with you on that kind of level. And I don't know um, 
if it's, you know, like a hyper sense, I guess, you know, maybe you thought that you saw something, but you didn't actually see it with your eyes, but you saw it with your third eye because you were kind of on that same level. So in my mind, I think what kind of ghost or what kind of spirit would spend time in like a cellar or a food store? Like immediately when I read that, like intuitively, I kind of wondered if it had been used as a place to hold bodies at some point. And it was quite common for uh, buildings of this vintage, even pubs and um, like hotels, anywhere that had some kind of underground storage area. At, at some point, they probably did hold dead bodies because, you know, when this was built in 1867, there was no um, refrigeration. Do you know what I mean? So any kind of cool place would have been a place to store bodies, regardless of whether or not there was food there or food there at some later point. So maybe what you were seeing was either a spirit of a dead person that had been stored down there, or maybe it was somebody who had just taken their job very seriously, like somebody who was, um, you know, a mortuary worker or, you know, that's, that's the kind of energy that I was kind of picking up on. You know, I could say too, like the temperature change could have very well have been just because you were going downstairs into a cellar. Of course it is going to, um, change temperature when you go underground like that. But the other thing about it too, is, is that a lot of people say that when they are in the presence of some kind of spirit or ghost, that temperatures do change. So yeah, I guess as well with those kind of buildings, the sensation that you were feeling, I'm not sure about how the wiring was set up, but I do know that sometimes, uh, older buildings tend to feel more haunted because they have dodgy wiring. And it's the same thing. Like 1867, I could imagine, uh, I don't know if, if it would have been, it, it wouldn't have been built with working electricity in 1867 in Australia, I don't believe. So it means that it probably had electrical wiring retrofitted. Um, you know, I could do a whole video on uh, Victorian era electrical appliances and just how like crazy they were. Uh, like just quickly, they used to use like paper for insulating electrical wires. So, you know, there's that. Basically, long story short, what that means is that uninsulated wiring in older homes may actually make them feel a bit more creepier because of the fact that there is higher electromagnetic frequency in those kind of areas. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that if there are people who investigate this area for, you know, ghostly phenomena, I'm sure that they would take baseline EMF readings in certain in certain rooms, um, you know, I think as well, depending on maybe what the material was that the building was built from, if it was built from sandstone, uh, you know, I'm not sure about like the acoustics of certain buildings. I often wonder if there are basements or things which kind of are built underground. I wonder how the acoustics of certain buildings might be able to like funnel noises and potentially influence infrasound. So maybe that's also the reason why we have those kind of feelings of dread when we're underground. But yeah, like you said, you saw something out of the corner of your eye and I know that you were in that mind frame that you were going to be more serious as well. So that may have been the reason why you actually saw something because basically this whole episode and the last Tiva tangent, I said, I spoke about just how amazing it is what we actually do see when we're actively looking for things as opposed to just going with the flow, I guess. 
Well, once again, guys, we're at the end of the episode and I'd just like to thank you so much for joining me and staying all the way through. I love seeing you every single week. I love making these podcasts for you. I'm sorry that I've been a little bit off the ball. I'm particularly sorry to my wonderful patrons that support me each and every week. Um, I've been a little bit slack and lax on the early releases. Um, But yeah, you know what? This gives me great joy and it gives me so much purpose to be able to uh, make these podcasts and I have so much fun doing them and I really enjoy that there are other people out there that come along for this journey with me so thank you so much I really appreciate each and every one of you that listen in um what am I gonna say next week's G oh yeah last week was E and E for Enigma and I'm I am working on it I just I wasn't happy with my part of the podcast that I did I have the most hysterical fun interview that I did with my friend Chanel and we actually spoke about uh, the Eastern Airlines flight 401 that crashed in the Everglades in the 70s and I am absolutely going to release it but like I said I've turned it into ears for enigma (laughs) <laughs> and you know enigma can be a week late that's fine that's fine right so um i know that you're probably dying to hear that and i can't wait for you all to meet my friend chanel because she's so much fun and i'm sure that she will be a regular on the show when when you guys realize how awesome she is so um yeah alrighty guys that's it from me please follow me on all my social media i'm on instagram at um a is for alien podcast i've got a reddit page and i've got a facebook page that i'd love for you to come and join you can post any kind of like stories or any kind of leads there that you might like for me to see i'd really appreciate that and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And um, that's it for me. Next week's G. And I reckon, I've got a feeling, I reckon I'm going to do the Green Man next week. Let me know what you think. If you've got any other better ideas for G. All right, guys. I love you. Bye-bye. And good night, Mr. Gers, wherever you are.